Okay. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome everybody. Also on behalf of Annette Hoffman and uh, Gerhard Wolf. Uh, to the event of this Tuesday afternoon that is part of our series of lectures on the art of Georgia and more broadly the Caucasus. Lecture series organ is organized by the Kunsthistorisches Institute in cooperation with the Georgia Binashvili National Research Center in Tbilisi and it brings together the most prominent scholars in the field. I'm especially delighted to welcome and introduce our today's speaker, Michele Bacci, Professor of Medieval Art at the University of Fribourg, Switzerland, and a member of Academy of Europe. His broad research interests and academic uh, achievements are well known for many of us, but I will pay attention to some. Michele Bacci gained his PhD at Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, uh, in 1999 and was an, an associated professor for medieval art history at the University of Siena from 2002 before moving to University of Fribourg in 2011. Professor Bacci is the author of numerous studies on the artistic and cultural interactions in the medieval Mediterranean and beyond, as well as uh, on the history of religious practices associated with cult objects and holy sites. His books include Il Penello del Evangelista, published in 1998, Pro Rimedeo Anime, uh, published in 2000, Lo Spazio del Anima, published in 2005, and San Nicola il Grande Dauma Turgo, uh, which was published in 2009. The other books are uh, The Many Faces of Christ, published in 2014, The Magic Cave, A History of Nativity Church in Bethlehem, published in 2017, and his last book, Veneto Byzantine Interactions in Icon Painting, has been recently published by the Academy of Athens in Greek language. Professor Bacci is representing on scientific board of many institutions. Since, to, since 2010, he is a member of the International Consortium Team for the Restoration of the Nativity Church in Bethlehem, Palestine. He is member of the advisory and editorial boards of several academic publications, including Iconographica, Mediterranean Art Histories, Convivium, and others. He has been responsible for the organization of numerous scientific events, and I want to mention international conference, cultural interactions in medieval Georgia, which was organized together with Manuela Studer in the University of Freiburg in 2017. Conference proceedings with the same title were published later together, co-edited uh, with um, Thomas Kaffenberg and Manuela Studer, and it includes a brilliant introduction, Georgia and the Outside World, published uh, by Michele Bacci. Uh, Michele Bacci's interest in the Caucasus and especially his friendship with Georgia has a long history. Almost 20 years, he has been participating in many summer schools and workshops in different parts of Georgia, including Svaneti, organized jointly by Chubinashvili Center and Kulsk Historians Institute. Just before the pandemics was our last joint summer school, which was organized by Chubinashvili Center in collaboration with Historicians Institute, University of Freiburg and University of Basel. And it took us from Georgia to high mountains of Northeastern Turkey, to medieval Georgian monasteries, later to become another inspiration for our colleagues to develop their research for our seminars in situ. Uh, before passing the word to our speaker, I would like to remind you of a few practical matters. 
We kindly request that you do not record this event and that you mute yourself during the lecture. After the lecture, please turn on your videos for the discussion in order to ask questions directly to the speaker. The discussion will be moderated by my colleague Annette Hoffman. Locating and constructing new zones in medieval South Caucasus. Michele Bacci, please, floor is yours. Thank you, Irini, for the kind introduction. And since you mentioned our study trip in Tauklerjeti in September 2019, I have to confess that on that occasion I was not very well prepared, even if I was aware of eh, and happy for the privilege I was offered by you, by Eka, by several other friends, to be initiated to hardly accessible monuments. I was, was mostly looking at them in an absent-minded mood, tired as I was by many other journeys and commitments. Strong impressions left to me by local landscapes disappeared almost immediately after the trip to re-emerge only some months later as the 2020 lockdown subset our lives, but at least rewarded all of us with some free time for meditation or activity. So prevented from traveling, I started looking at my pictures and trying to make sense of them while seeking answers in several excellent studies published by Georgian scholars, many of which I was lucky enough to have in my personal library. What I'm offering today are some ruminations and afterthoughts reflecting the mental state of a compulsive traveler suddenly turned into a hermit. So uh, we can start sharing. Okay. So seeing through the glass of present day geopolitics, the Artvin province in Northeast Turkey looks much more like a remote, hardly accessible and almost unheard of edge of the contemporary world, scarcely populated and dominated by the mountainous landscape of the most elevated peaks in the Pontic Alps and the ancient Pariadres, today's Kachkar Dalaru. It is therefore difficult to believe that more than 1,000 years ago, in the 10th century, this was one of the most prosperous and strategically crucial regions of the Middle East, known in Georgian as Tau Klarjeti. And after the Islamic conquest of most of the sub caucasian region in the mid 7th century, the area being housed to religiously and linguistically mixed populations gradually emerged as a stronghold of Georgian culture constituted as a de facto independent principality under the rule of the Bagratic dynasty, it quickly came to impose its control on the trade routes from Trebizond to Kartli and Armenia. In return for their alliance, rulers were given by the Byzantines the honorary title of Kuropalates, uh, which was considered as one of the highest dignities in the court of Constantinople. The heyday was reached during the long government of David III you know, between 966 uh, and 1000 or 1001, who is also known as the Great. You know? The large incomes stemming from tolls and commercial exchanges were invested in the construction of bridges and a complex system of fortresses scattered throughout the country. The defenses of the capital town. Ardanuji were also reinforced, um, a coinment was established, and the court directly engaged in founding or financing new churches and monasteries, which stood out as important centers of spiritual and cultural life. And I would like to lay emphasis on this monastic experience. Remote, as they may appear today, the sites chosen for these foundations were far less extreme than in previous times. The improved security conditions in the country 
enabled monks to settle in inhospitable wildernesses that were relatively easy to access. Furthermore, they exploited the available space in a rather confident way, promoting the erection of large structures and without making use of any fortified enclosure. In the Lavra, known as Otkta uh, Ecclesia, Dirt Kilis in Turkish, cells and chapels were scattered on both sides of the steep gorge carved by a tributary of the Choru Chorohi River, known after the monument as, uh, as Otkta Ecclesi Skali, if, if I pronounce it correctly. The presence of multiple buildings probably explains its name, meaning four churches. The interaction of the monastic complex with the surrounding landscape, standing out for its luxuriant vegetation, was meant to arouse the visitor's emotional involvement. Situated at the height of circa um, 1,335 1, meters on the steep slopes of a mountain whose summit reaches 3,000 meters, it occupied a roughly triangular, artificially carved platform made to enable the construction of a huge imposing structure in an apparently unstable, unusual, and improbable location. By choosing that place, the monks could have the feeling of living in the liminal dimension of a virtual desert, turned into the reflection of an Edenic garden suspended between God's earthly creation and the celestial heights, metaphorically evoked by the elevation of the nearby snow-clad peaks. In so doing, they were also aware that, thanks to their saintly life, those same mountains could have resounded with the same mystical evoca evocativeness that biblical typology, liturgical hymns, and hagiographic literature were accustomed to associate with the memorial sites of sacred history. What remains of the long abandoned complex at Otta is enough to make clear that it was extremely well equipped and comfortable. It included a wide refectory, a two-storied ossuary, and probably also a scriptorium, which were most plausibly meant for a large and wealthy community. The most important structure was the Catholic home. It was given the shape of a three-aisle basilica made of finely cut ashlar blocks and embellished on its exterior walls with elegant sequences of blind arcades. The overall dimensions of the building were impressive, especially on account of its astonishing height of uh, 22 meter. It stood out for a massive imposing appearance that seemed to visually surrogate the rocky or inspiring materiality of the mountain it was erected on. This impression must have been enhanced in the Middle Ages as today, by it's being mostly concealed by thick vegetation. The church appears suddenly in its full majesty after visitors had gone through the hoods and orchards that surrounded it. A few Assom Tavruli inscription displayed on the external walls of the main church and an associated building bear witness to the association of the Lavra with David III and members of his court. Since in one of them, the ruler is simply evoked by his name, whereas in two cases, he's remembered more specifically in his quality as Kuropalates, it has been suggested that the works must have started in the first half of his rule, that's in the 1960, it had been achieved after 977 or 78, when he was granted the honorary title by Emperor Basil II. There are some archaeological and historical grounds, however, to assume that the present building was preceded by one or even two construction phases whose dating cannot be precisely assessed. Nevertheless, it is evident that the Kirk promoted its transformation into a distinctively monumental church whose old-fashioned architectural type, a three-aisle basilica with vaulted nave, could remind visitors of early Christian antecedents. It cannot be by chance that a building of approximately the same size and shape was erected also on the initiative of, David the, of the court of David III in 973 as the Catholic of Parhali Monastery, which was situated on the northern slopes 
of the same mountain along another tributary of the Choruk and was connected via a pasture track to Otkta. This seems to indicate that the Kurd was particularly interested in promoting the whole area as a worship worthy land. Site bound holiness is a quality that is frequently perceived in association with regions that on some grounds are deemed to be separate, idiosyncratic and liminal, that is marking a threshold between different levels of reality. Indeed, the Choruch Basin was certainly borderline in political terms. Its roads led to Lazica to the north and to Speri, present day Ispir, and the Byzantine Empire to the southwest. Furthermore, it also stood out as other areas of southern Tau for its mixed population, including both Georgian and Armenian speaking groups. The region had long been part of the Armenian district of Taik and had been acquired in relatively recent times by the Bagratids, who, by the way, had been themselves originally related to the Bagratuni princely family of Armenia. The movement initiated in the ninth century by Grigol of Hanzta and his followers, who established the Georgian bishopric at Ishkani already prior to the political annexation of the area, strongly engaged in the imposing Chalcedonian belief. Through baptism, local Armenians were separated from the so-called Amatuni, later Hemshin, who lived on the northern slopes of the Pontic Alps and kept loyal to the Myophysite creed before converting to Islam in Ottoman times. For the later, for the latter, the huge mountain that separated them from Tao was directly associated with their spiritual life. Its Turkish name, Mount Kachkar, is clearly the corruption of the Armenian word Kachkar, meaning cross. Indeed, a monastery of the cross, Hachekarvank or Hachevank, on its northern slopes, close to the place known today as Hachinavak, is known to have been visited as a pilgrimage shrine until the late Ottoman period. It has been suggested that this may be identified with the old diocesan see of Hachekar, that some colophons of the 15th and 16th century um, manuscripts locate in a monastery consecrated to Saint Khachichol, probably the founder, whose relics were worshipped there with those of the Armenian martyr king Bartam Mamikonian and his comrades in the two chapels, um, in two chapels, one dedicated to the Virgin and the other to the Holy Zion, Sur Psyovn. If this identification proves true, we should assume that the cross epithet resulted from the gradual misunderstanding of the original dedication. Even if all the evidence we have on this monastic establishment is relatively late, it can be assumed that it was strongly rooted in collective memory if there was no break in its public worship, even after the Hemshin Armenians were converted to Islam. Resilience to cultic oblivion may have been largely due to the long-standing cross-cultural understanding of the wider area of the Kachkar Massif as invested with a super late, superlative degree of holiness. Undoubtedly, it owned all those characteristics that, according to Grigol of Hansta, were to be expected from monastic deserts. In his view, they had been established by God as special spaces that interrupted the earthly surface and had been reserved since the days of creation for the settling of monks fleeing from the seductions of profane life. Far from being inhospitable and extreme, such natural refugees uh, were rich in vegetation and water, benefited from a mild weather, and lacked proper roads, so making any access uh, difficult to those living in the world. If the latter had to be renounced and abandoned, it was one such desert that had to be sought for. Escaping to mountain monasteries, was regarded as an option, even by members of the aristocratic elite who became disenchanted with political and military life. A close friend of David III, who in keeping with his time's fashion, bore the Arabic name of Abul Herit and was a cousin of the famous general Johanne Tourny, 
retired in the 1960s to the Lavrovot Ecclesia, where he devoted himself to ascesis and came to be known as Father John Ioanni. His life, written by Georgi Tatsmideli in uh, uh, 1044 45, is the first source to mention the monastery. It must have been perceived as a very isolated and therefore a superlatively holy area if it could be chosen by a public person who aimed to hide himself from the world and be closer to God. Soon, his extraordinary commitment to contemplative life, unexpected from a nobleman, filled the other monks with wonder, fearing that this may induce him to commit the sin of arrogance. He spent the subsequent years, as other ascetics had done before him, in seeking the mountain where he could be protected from any temptations. So after a period of Mount Olympus in Bithynia, he finally arrived with his son Ectime, or Eutemius in the Athos Peninsula, where he founded the small Georgian synobium of St. John the Evangelist near the Great Lavra, which was replaced in 979 by the much larger Iviron Monastery erected with the support of the Byzantine court after the defeat of the rebel general Bardas Cleros that had been made possible by the intervention of David III. For these monks, the mountains that, where they chose to settle were overladen with symbolic meanings, which offered important clues as to their interpretation of reality as interspersed with divine signs. The perception of orographic prominences as separate words that were turned into anticipations of paradise through the agency of ascetic life was strongly informed by hagiographic narratives on the deeds and virtues of the Holy Fathers of old, which were read as soul benefiting exemplar. Their massiveness and steadiness were viewed as a natural metaphor of the eternal life promised to those who committed themselves to Christ. In their elevation and verticality, it was easy to detect a visual encouragement to raise one's sight towards heaven, and the physical stress associated with their climbing was understood as an anagogical or moral signifier of the hardships and difficulties of ascetic life, as John Climacus had indicated in his ladder of divine ascent. Furthermore, when glancing at prominent rocks and peaks, sedulous readers of the Holy Scriptures could hardly refrain from linking them with the distant mountains where God had revealed himself to mankind. In a contemplative experience, Sinai and Tabor, Moria and Zion, Golgotha and the Mount of Olives all coalesced around the summit of their refuge mountain, which, which they regarded as material allegories of the mystical access to the divine they were longing for. Biblical allegorism was not only a matter of rhetorical emphasis or a sort of intellectual exercise. Just on the contrary, it played a crucial role in the monk's worldview, and it was expected to be enacted not only in ascetic practice, but also in liturgical life. Inasmuch as the house of God, it is the Old Testament temple prefiguring the Christian church, was described in the Bible as the hate of Mount Zion or Temple Mount, mountain symbolism permeated liturgical formulae and hymns. According to the life of Grigol of Hansta, taking the priestly vows and acting as an officiant was described with the words of Psalm 24, three to four, as an ascent to the Lord's mountain. But there was more to this. The memorial authority of biblical mountains could be transferred through rituals into the monastic space. As Georgi Tatsmideli's life of Ioanne and Evctime makes clear, the Ivira monks were accustomed to perform the office of the Transfiguration Feast on the summit of Mount Athos. By so doing, their mountain was turned into a new tabor as they physically and kinetically imitated Christ's and his three disciples' path, and the Eucharistic rite made God present in that place in the same way 
as he had manifested himself in his son's transfigured body and vestments, circumfused with supernatural light on a hill of Galilee. On one occasion, a supernatural sign made clear that the ritual repetition was not just evocative of, but also conducive to a mystical encounter with the divine. As soon as the priests began to sing the Trisagion, the peak was shaken by an earthquake and Ephctime was soon was seen wrapped in fire. This vision could but remind the elders of the Lord's apparition in the burning bush on Sinai. And since uh, the latter was the site of God's revelation and alliance with the Jewish people, it was described in Christian exegesis as foreshadowing the manifestation of Christ's divine nature on, on Tabor. And the connection was so strong and obvious that the transfiguration was given a prominent position in the sixth century mosaic decoration, the Catholicon of the Sinai Monastery, where it was directly linked to the images displayed on the triumphal arch of Moses taking off his sandals before the bush and receiving the tablets of the law. And all this is known uh, from uh, a wonderful article by Gerhard, Gerhard Wolf. The message conveyed by the Sinai mosaics was undoubtedly very efficacious. As Anastasius of Sinai stated in his homily on the transfiguration, the liturgical commemoration revealed another Sinai, or rather a mountain much more precious than Sinai in its mirac miraculous reality, surpassing those symbolic shadowy visions of God with divine revelations that are closely modeled on them. What was initiated on Horeb was contemplated on Mount Tabor. If on the former, the sight or spiritual understanding of the Lord had been imperfect and incomplete, like a glance through mist and clouds, on the latter, the divine mysteries had been made visible as a preview of both Mount Golgotha, the through the Son of God's sacrifice and resurrection, redeem mankind from the original sin, and Mount Zion, that is the establishment of the ecclesia that enabled human access to the kingdom of heaven, the upper Jerusalem. In keeping with St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, chapters 8 to 10, the relationship of the old and new alliances was described in terms of contrast between shadow and image, partial and full vision, materiality and spirituality, as well as hiddenness and accessibility. The Lord's presence in an earthly place had been replaced by the Savior's glorious body. Mount Zion had been superseded by the heavenly Jerusalem, and Solomon's temple could now be simply regarded as an imperfect anticipation of the shrine not made by human hands, embodied in the, by the community of believers. Biblical allegorism was viewed by Marx as a useful way of describing their experience since it was invested with a strong anagogical efficacy. In its etymological sense of being brought up words, anagogy meant elevating themselves from the imperfect and incomplete state of human nature to the fullness of spiritual seeing. The kinetic implication of the ascent metaphor were all pervasive. Adopting monastic life meant physically climbing a mountain, and in so doing, one could easily believe to follow Isaiah's invitation to go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob, along paths that God himself could have shown. As the life of Johann and Devkhtime made clear, all the activities associated with monastic life, such as founding a monastery, endowing it with properties, erecting a church looking like heaven, embellishing it with the splendor of worship worthy images, creating a community of brothers looking like angels, and establishing a scriptorium committed to the translation of religious books, were the final achievement of the same prophecy, stating that the law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In the case of Zion, the mountain metapha combined with the evocation of an architectural structure, that of the Jerusalem temple, whose erection had been decided by David and accomplished by Solomon. In Israelitic antiquity, 
and until its destruction in 70 AD. This one, located on the top of the Ophel Hill, had been described as God's dwelling on earth. And it was there, in a precisely defined spot of geographic space, that the interaction of the human and divine dimensions based on the dynamics of sacrifice could take place. In Byzantine times, the area had been intentionally left empty uh, and in a ruinous state, in such a way that visitors could be dramatically reminded that the Shekinah did no longer reside there. In the fourth century, the memorial, locative, and sightbound qualities of the old temple were transferred to the site of Golgotha, which stood on the southern western hill and uh, uh, on a more elevated height than the Temple Mount. The Rock of Christ's crucifixion was artfully shaped in such a way to make it look as a steep, stylized, and miniaturized mount. Later on, in the second half of the century, Christians promoted a new localization of Mount Zion on the southernmost edge of the western hill, again on a position dominating the Ophel, and erected there a huge church that, unlike the Holy Sepulchre or the Eleona Basilica, derived its prestige not only from its role as mnemotopos of biblical events, but also from its description as the place where the first Christian liturgy that is the Last Supper, had been performed. Therefore, it could be rightly viewed as an archetypal ritual space, praised as the mother of all churches and said to have been constructed by the apostles. Dedicated to the Holy Zion, Ahia Sion, it stood out for the imposing dimension of its longitudinal planned building. In a homily by Bishop John II from 394, the place was celebrated as both a reflection of the heavenly Jerusalem and the monumental embodiment of the ecclesia notion that had been foreshadowed by the Sinai Tabernacle and Solomon's Temple, as well as many other scriptural types. In this way, the Holy City was provided with a new Zion that rose above the old one and whose major elevation was further emphasized by its, its association with the apostles upper room mentioned in Acts, uh, in the Acts of the Apostle 113, where the descent of the Holy Spirit had taken place. In keeping with Psalm 86, verse 1, the gates of Zion love by God could be rightly said to have been founded once again on a holy mountain. Virtually every Christian church could be perceived as conflating the multiple spatial memorial ritual and typological meanings condensed around Jerusalem's new Zion. In this sense, when a consecrated building was compared or even dedicated to the Holy Zion, it was almost self-evidently understood as a, as a mnemonic indicator of all the biblical topoi it was related to. In sixth century, Lisha, a monastery erected on the summit of a local mountain, and dedicated to the Holy Zion, became the center from which the conversion of rural population in the countryside of Myra was accomplished. In the life of the saint who took his name from it, Nicholas of Mount Zion, it was said to be a divine dwelling inhabited by the dynamis of God's presence and a replica antitibos or better, perhaps a reflection or surrogate of the Jerusalem church, by the, by the virtue of which demons were expelled from the trees and springs venerated by peasants. Its location was revealed by an epiphany of light from heaven, which was intended as a memorial sign and a place of propitiation for the sins. The term employed, ilastirion, was the same used in the Greek Bible for the atonement cover of the Ark of the Covenant, on which the Shekinah manifested itself, and by John II in his homily to hint at the newly erected church in, the, in Jerusalem. For the anonymous geographer, the Zion title had the power of turning the local most prominent hate, today's site of Al-Ajahisar, into a new Sinai, a new Jerusalem, and an anticipation of the kingdom of heaven. In much the same way, 
It is likely that before the Solomonic kings of Ethiopia, who were said to descend from the Queen of Sheba, claimed possession of Moses' Ark in the late 15th century, the dedication to Mariam Seon of Aksum Cathedral may have been meant not so much to describe it as a direct heir to Solomon's temple, but rather as an equivalent to Jerusalem's first consecrated church. In the sub-Caucasian context, Holy Zion's symbolism was not less pervasive. This was certainly made easier by the strong impact of the Jerusalemite or Hajapolite rite on local liturgical habits, regardless of theological distinctions. In the late seventh or early eighth century, an anonymous Armenian homily praised the monastery of Mount Varag for its state of distinctive worship worthiness associated with the relic of the Holy Cross that had turned that mountain into a veritable second Zion and upper Jerusalem greater than Sinai. Not far from there, in circa 901 to 2, Prince Gagik Arzruni of Aspurakan became committed to invest his newly conquered capital, Van, with a superlatively sacred status by erecting a church consecrated to the Holy Zion that is in Jerusalem, a two-storied building that included altars dedicated to Golgotha, the resurrection, the ascension, and, and I quote, the upper room of the mystical celebration of the transmission of the new covenant, end of quote. Quite explicitly, the Zion dedication was here meant to surrogate the most important loca sancta in the holy city, yet in the aim not so much to establish a local form of site bound web of pilgrimage sites, but rather to enhance the prestige of the local church by evoking the main liturgical stations of the Enkenya octave, September 13th to 20th in the Jerusalem light, right, which commemorated the dedication of the main town shrines, Martyrium, Anastasis, Eliona, and Holy Zion. In the collection of early Georgian chronicles, known as Kartli's Tschovreba, and especially in the probably 9th century life of Bachtang Gorgasali, the Zveti Tschoveli Cathedral in Kartli's capital, Tscheta, was characterized as both a holy of holies, that is a place of worship worthy, as worship worthy as the inner room of Solomon's temple, and a great or holy Zion. The dedication to the 12 apostles made clear that this latter expression did not simply hint at the holy city as a whole, but also more specifically at the mother of all churches located on its southwestern hill. The 8th and 9th century conversion of Cartley described it as the place of holy Zion and the house of God, which was invoked by believers as the personified addressee of their prayers and offerings. The Zion dedication conveying the idea of the Christian Ecclesia as a new Mount Zion and a new temple was repeated in the many Sioni churches erected in the country at some Shvilde, Bolnisi, Tbilisi, Ateni, and elsewhere. Not infrequently, they also stood out for their longitudinal plan structure, which may have echoed the architectural form of their Jerusalem archetype, or at least it would be tempting to think so. But in this respect, it is difficult to assess uh, to what extent the adoption of the Basilica type may have been intentionally perceived as a strategy to enhance the association of a building with Jerusalem in a Krautheimerian way, that is in terms of architectural mimesis, imitating the monumental frames erected around the Loca Sancta was not self-evidently the focus of whoever aimed to evoke the holy city in a distant place. It would be certainly tempting to assume that the rather surprising choice of an already old-fashioned longitudinal plan for the big-sized churches of both Otta and Parhali was dictated by the wish to precisely reproduce the Jerusalem Hayasion, whose exact shape is in any case impossible to reconstruct. If central planned round or polygonal buildings like Bana Cathedral in the Penek Valley could more easily remind beholders of the Anastasis Rotunda, 
it cannot be ruled out that some connection with the Zion church may have been detected also in large basilicas. Nevertheless, even in this case, emphasis on architectural similarity must have worked as a rhetorical topos by which the semantic complexity of the Zion notion was hinted at through the visual evocation of the Jerusalem building that bore the same name. So be this as it may, the Eastern Christian Translatio Jerusalem was operated more through the agency of liturgical rites than by means of architectural replicas. The old Jerusalem liturgy were stational rituals performed in the very sites of the corresponding gospel events played a key role, was taken as a model by the Sarcocasian churches to such an extent that most or the old Hajapolite lectionaries, calendars, hymns, and homilies, including the aforementioned one by Bishop John II, are known only from Armenian and Georgian translations. In the liturgy of St. James, Zion was evoked as part of the diptychs for the living, not as a generic hint of the Holy City, but as the most important among its loca santa, a particular building dating from apostolic times that embodied the idea of the universal church. And so we offer you, O oh Lord, this awful and bloodless sacrifice for your holy places, which you have glorified by the appearance of your Christ. First of all, for the holy and glorious Zion, the mother of all churches, and throughout the world, for your holy Catholic and apostolic church, grant her the gifts of the Holy Spirit, in abundance. As the archetypal consecrated building in the holy city, the Zion Church was understood as a metonymic signifier of the church as both community of believers and the ecclesiastical institution which anticipated the heavenly Jerusalem and had been prefigured by the revelation of Sinai, the Ark of the Covenant, and Solomon's Temple. This connection came even more clearly to the fore in dedication rites, which on their turn were strongly informed by the formulae and hymns used in the Octave of Jerusalem in Kenya. On the third day of this feast, September the 15th, the Ordo originally performed on Mount Zion included a reading from St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, 8, 7 uh, till 9, 10, which contrasted the old with the new covenant and emphasized the incompleteness and the inadequacy of the rite performed in the temple. In particular, it clearly suggested that the new Zion was the holy site where Jesus, as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, had performed the sacrifice of the age of grace. This contrast would even be more pregnant if, as some scholars have suggested, the Enkenya did appropriate features of the Jewish Yom Kippur festival, also occurring at the beginning of autumn. In a homily probably written in the ninth century, Bishop John of Bolognese, whose cathedral was a Sioni church, explained that the Holy Zion, founded by the apostles, superseded the old temple since it had been replicated with God's presence by the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles' head in the form of tongues of fire. There, David's prophecy was accomplished as not only the Jews, but all nations were flocking there to prostrate themselves before the Lord. The Georgian liturgical hymns included in the Yadgari compilation of Troparia dating from the eighth century, but reflecting earlier materials, stress this point further as the mother of all churches in whom the Holy Spirit came to dwell the Holy Zion, and with it all Christian churches, were the new abode of God's presence. Zion was also given a prominent place in the world paintings that embellished the monasteries erected in the times of David III on the north and south slopes on the Pontic Alps. The Parhali murals, dating from circa 973, and now almost completely vanished, but known from Nikolai Okunia's photographs uh, dating from 1917, and those at Octa Ecclesia that are still readable, albeit in a lamentably decaying state. 
In both buildings, the painted decorations were concentrated in the unusually elevated apses, which displayed a strongly complex program of images structured in almost the same way with small variations. The conch was reserved for a theophanic representation of the glory of God with Christ shown within a mandorla of light flanked by angels and symbols of the tetramorph. The composition hinted at both Ezekiel's uh, vision of the new temple and the apocalyptic revelation of, to John of the heavenly Jerusalem visually merged with the ascension scene displayed on the upper layer of the apse. In Otkta, however, a representation of the angelic hierarchies worshiping the Hetoimasia, Christ and the throne, symbolizing his second coming, was interposed between the two scenes, thus investing the program with a more evident eschatological nuance. The lower portions of the semicircular walls were rendered in a slightly different way in the two monastic churches, whereas Parhali reserves the upper row for the prophets that announced the Messiah and two lower ones for a very detailed cycle of gospel events, Otta leaves all the upper space to the ascension and occupies the lower portion with the procession of Old Testament figures and church fathers headed by David and Solomon and an abridged uh, selection of Christological scenes. In both buildings, the real focus of the whole program corresponded to the central large window whose thick intradose was decorated with images that being located on the most constantly illuminated and therefore immediately eye-catching part of the apse were clearly given a very special emphasis. The evidence provided by all photos is enough to confirm that uh, the same subject were represented also at Parhali, even if they are certainly better readable in Otkta. In a sense, these paintings, sorry, these paintings worked as a figurative frame to the sunshine penetrating to the sacred space, which itself was perceived as a metaphoric light embodying divine presence. It was toward this light that Moses represented to the left, receiving the tablets of the law from God's hand on the summit of Mount Sinai, turned his head in such a way that he was attributed a posture contrasting with his body's climbing movement. If it was common to lay emphasis on the prophet's incomplete vision, which according to Exodus 33 um, was limited to the Lord's backside, by showing his eyes looking downwards, the choice to show him thoroughly averting his sight from the divine revelation is certainly very idiosyncratic and seems to suggest his precognition of the fullness of contem contemplative experience granted to believers in the age of grace. On the left side of the window stands a bearded figure uh, whose interpretation is less obvious. He stands close to a structure that is covered with a thick imposing drapery and houses an altar over which he is pouring a liquid from a vessel, whereas he holds a mysterious object, possibly a bread, in his left hand. Most scholars, including Zaza's Hirtladze in his uh, 2009 monograph, suggest the identification with Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who had blessed Abraham and was described in St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, seven as a forerunner of Christ in his priestly role, even if Aaron, in my view, the archetypal Levite, is, uh, um, is also a good candidate. The two Old Testament figures are frequently associated and are attributed similar vestments and facial features. They wear a long beard, long hair, a mantle of lacerna, richly decorated with precious stones, and a fod, a long tunic, and a tefillin or phylactery on the forehead, which as is seen in Otta, can be occasionally transformed into the upper protuberance of a bejeweled crown-like head covering by which artists aim to fancifully reconstruct the appearance of the high priest's mitre. Whereas Aaron is usually shown holding a censer and an incense box, as e.g. in the late 11th or early 12th century mosaics in St. Sophia in Kiev. 
Melchizedek is mostly rendered in scenes displaying his meeting with Abraham or him celebrating the liturgy. In later Byzantine arts, he's represented among other Old Testament figures holding a paten with bread and a jug of wine, but, but to the best of my knowledge, he's never shown performing a libation, a ritual action associated according to Exodus 30, verse 9 and uh, uh, 38, with the altar of burnt offerings or brazen altar in the tabernacle. If this is the case, we should imagine that Aaron, rather than the king of Salem, is here represented in the act of sprinkling the outdoor altar with a drink offering before the entrance to the tent of, of the congregation, whose textile materiality is overemphasized by its strongly marked concentrical folds. At the same time, it must be admitted that the employee solution is highly idiosyncratic. Curtains appear frequently in Byzantine images of the desert tabernacle, hinting at both the parochet veil of the Holy of Holies and at the tent itself, but they are hardly attributed such a massive, imposing and irregular shape. The structure housing the Ark of the Covenant is given a mountain-like appearance that establishes a visual dialogue with the silhouette of Mount Sinai on the opposite side and visually prefigures the Temple Mount as the last destination for the Israelites' movable house of God. This Jerusalem connection was reinforced by the display of David and Solomon, respectively the promoter and the builder of the temple on both sides of the window. Since the Bagratis trace their ancestry to David himself, as is recorded by Constantine Prophyrogenitors, it is certainly possible that their presence in such prominent position may have also been invested with political nuances. Like the other Old Testament figures displayed close by, their gestures are pivotal in orienting viewers towards the upper portions of the wall and more specifically towards the medallion displayed on the top of the window. This one is flanked by cornucopias and houses a half-length female figure holding a church model that reproduces the basic architectural features, longitudinal plan blind arcades, of Othta Ecclesia and its twin building at Parhali. She wears a precious mantle and a decorated tunic, and her head is embellished with a tall bejeweled crown. An inscription in Mrglovani script declares her identity unequivocally. She's Sioni, the holy sign. As scholars rightly pointed out, the image personifies Zion in its multiple meanings, as the community of believers or ecclesia, as the wisdom of God, Sophia, and as the kingdom of heaven. Similar, though not identical, solutions are found in Byzantine illuminated manuscripts, such as the 9th century Kludov Psalter, where she is directly associated with the representation of the Holy City, or the 11th century Barberinus Grecus 372 World Vatican Library, which displays her enthroned and garbed as an empress. The most striking feature at Octa is the odd-shaped crown she wears on her head. On iconographic grounds, it can be assumed to derive from the mural crowns that were used in antiquity as attributes of a city's tiche. In Roman times, the tiche of Elia Capitolina, as Jerusalem had been renamed, was represented in a similar way with a turreted diadem and a cornucopia, and similar images remain popular in Byzantine Palestine, as is indicated by sixth century mosaic in Beth Shean, and a contemporary marble image from a church in Horvat in Shemet. Indeed, the symbolism of the mural crown largely permeated the biblical text. Isaiah IG described the city as a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God, and as a future queen that shall ascend to the throne and clothe herself with the strong and beautiful garments of her imposing walls. The formula used in the ancient Hajapolite liturgy for the third day of the Enkenia feast, commemorating the dedication of the Zion church, 
also laid a strong emphasis on this royal association, as is best exemplified by one hymn preserved in the Armenian Sharag notes. As you see, rejoice today, your holy church, and celebrate your feast, O daughter of Zion, for the Lord was pleased to dwell in you, the God of our fathers. Rejoice, queen, daughter of Zion, and exalt of supernal Jerusalem, for Christ the King of heaven is coming to you, etc. Rejoice, Zion, mother church, for upon you the divine ray from the Father of light has shone, etc. A similar view of the mother of all churches as a crowned queen is repeated in the hymns for the Enkenya preserved in the Georgian Yadgari. Today all the faithful rejoice and the Holy Church is crowned for in it uh, the Holy Spirit has made um, his dwelling. In keeping with this characterization the personification of Zion appears in all her glory in a dominating position. The prophets and saints of the old and new alliance converge towards her who supersedes and replaces the sides of divine revelation that had foreshadowed the Christian church in all its multiple meanings. Through the attribute of the church model that also works as a synecdochical signifier of the lavra itself, she indicates that Otta Ecclesia is not only a spot on the earthly surface, but also a new divine dwelling where God is metonymically made present through the agency of liturgical performance and, litur and monastic life. Her image is connected along a vertical line with the Virgin Orant, the Hetoimesia, and the Lord's glory in the conch. Below is the opening of the window whose narrow, elevated shape culminating in a round arch seems to visually interact with the summit of Sinai and the spherical top of the tent of the covenant. Apart from introducing light with all its metaphorical associations into the altar space, it also contributes to orientate the perception of the painted program. Far from showing the outside sky, it frames a segment of the steep rock wall on the opposite side of the valley and reshapes it into the image of a stylized, geometrically rendered mountain, which comes in this way to interact with the close by images. The symbolic desert inhabited by Georgian monks on its northern and southern slopes and by Armenian ones on its eastern side was thus celebrated in its role as symbolic signifier of spiritual elevation as the holy mountain on which as stated in Psalm 86 and repeated in dedication rites, the gates of Zion had been steadily founded. I thank you very much for your attention.